Welcome back to another video. If you're stopping by the channel for the first time, please consider subscribing to my channel. And while you're at it, smash that like button for me. I really would appreciate it. Also, hit that post notification bell so that you're notified every time I upload a new video. Be careful down in the comment section of the videos. A lot of spam, a lot of scammers. I will never ask you to contact me by WhatsApp or Telegram. I also do not invest money for my subscribers, so please be careful. Don't get yourself scammed. If you want up to 15 free stocks, Moomoo is going to give you up to 15 free stocks. When you open a new Moomoo brokerage account, they're going to give you up to 15 free stocks for just trying out their brokerage app. When you put $100 in your new brokerage account, they're gonna give you five free stocks. When you put $1,000 in your new brokerage account, they're gonna give you 15 free stocks. Don't delay, get started today. There's a link down in the description box of this video. Go click on that Moomoo link. Open up that Moomoo account today. Put you some money in that Moomoo account. Get yourself in a position where you can start buying paper assets to build your wealth over these next 10 years. I'm going to send you guys my wealth transfer blueprint video that outlines the three big boy blue chip paper assets that I'm going to be buying in 2024 and beyond to double my net worth. All you got to do is send me an email and say, hey, Richard. I opened my Moomoo account. I've funded my Moomoo account. Send me that wealth transfer blueprint video where you're talking about those three big boy blue chip assets you're gonna be buying over the next 10 years to double your net worth, and I'll send you out that video. I'll also send you a Moomoo tutorial video that will walk you through how to use the Moomoo brokerage app to make your first trade. Now again, I'm not the expert, for Moomoo, Moomoo itself is the expert. Inside of the app, they have tutorials, what they call in-app tutorials. That'll walk you through how to do everything you need to do when it comes to buying paper assets. My goal is to provide a video that can collapse time frames for you and get you off to a quick start and help you navigate the Moomoo app. So, Click down in that description box, click on that Moomoo link, open up the Moomoo account today, go get that free stock, go get that free money, then send me an email and request those two videos, the Wealth Transfer Blueprint video and the Moomoo Tutorial video, and I'll send both of those out to you as well. No greater opportunity than right now to change your financial life, change the game in your financial life through paper assets, through other assets like real estate for income, through a business, which I call the big three. No better time than right now, guys, to transform your financial life into something great. But you got to get yourself off the sideline. You got to put yourself in the game. That's the only way it happens. How do you put yourself in the game? Get down to that description box, click on that Moo Moo link, Open up your new Moomoo account today and get yourself in the game. Things are moving fast, guys. We're going to cover some topics they, today that are literally changing the game. This information you need to know, it's going to put you in a position to be a better investor. The more information you know about what goes on in our financial markets, what goes on in our economy, what goes on with interest rates, inflation, the job market? What goes on in our assets market, which is stocks, crypto, real estate? The more you know, the better you become an investor. You take that information and you act on it. You execute on it. And that's what we're going to be doing today. We're going to talk about some things. We're going to talk about the Fed and how the Fed lost billions of dollars in 2023. 
I mean, where does that money come from? I mean, billions of dollars lost. Who pays for all of that? The Fed lost billions of dollars in 2023, and I don't think it's a big, a big deal. We'll, we'll talk about that. We're also going to talk about credit card companies. Got caught with their hand in the cookie jar. Got sued. We're going to talk about how that impacts you if you use credit cards. We're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about the labor market slash job market. And there are some people out there who think a pretty large crash is coming in the job market. I don't know. Some of you guys out there who are W-2 folks, you may want to pay attention to this part of the video. They are calling for a pretty, pretty, pretty large crash, softening in the labor market. May affect you, so stick around. We're going to talk about that. And then we're going to end the discussion today with more bank failures. We're going to talk about why there potentially could be more bank failures coming in 24 and 25 and how that impacts you. We're going to talk about that as well. Well, let's start the discussion with the Fed. And when I say Fed, I'm talking about Federal Reserve. Let's talk about the $114 billion dollars that they lost in 2023. And I'm telling you, you know who on the hook for all of this, guys. The American people. The American people are on the hook for all of this stuff. Anytime you see Fed slash government losing money, you know you're on the hook for it, me and you, because that's how they get funded, right? Let's read about this. Here's the headline. Fed posts record loss of 114.3 billion in 2023. That that already don't sound good, right? But let's 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 read on. The Federal Reserve said on Tuesday, which was March 26, that it will officially saw a net Negative income of 114 billion in 2023, a record loss tied to expenses related to managing the U.S. Central Bank's short-term interest rate target. This loss last year follows a 58.8 billion net income in 2022. The Fed said the numbers released were an audited tally following preliminary numbers reported earlier this year. The Fed has stressed repeatedly that negative. And this is don't make sense to me now, guys. This do not make sense to me. Check this out. The Fed has stressed repeatedly that net negative income does not impede its ability to operate or conduct monetary policy. How can you be operating in the red, but it don't affect you? It, it's no big deal. It's no big deal that, that you know, the Federal Reserve, you know, through its operations, it lost a hundred and, you know, basically $114 billion last year. No big deal. We're gonna still do what we gotta do. By law, the Fed hands over any profits after covering operational expenses to the Treasury. That would be the United States Treasury, right? So anytime they make money, they pay their expenses, anything that's left over by law, they have to hand it over to the United States Treasury. The Fed earns income from services it provides the financial system from interest income on securities it it owns, that would be treasury bonds, treasury notes, right? Treasury bills, right? That's a, that's, a, that's a security that it buys from the rest of the federal government, right? It'll buy those securities 
and they get an interest rate attached to them. And that interest rate, they earn money from that interest rate attached to that security. It has earned significant profits over recent years amid very low rates and large levels of, of bond holdings. Remember, I just told you they buy these treasury bonds, these treasury bills, treasury notes, right? And over the years, they made some money. The Fed's move to aggressively boost the federal funds rate, a.k.a. short-term interest rates, starting in the spring of 2022, has upended central bank finances. To cool inflation pressures, the Fed lifted the target from nearly zero levels in to 2.25 to 2.50. So basically in 2022, let's say January of 2022, the Fed funds rate was zero. I think it was like zero to, 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 to 0 0.25, basically zero. That means, guys, you could have walked into your local bank and borrowed money at the prime rate, which would have been 3%. That's what you'd have been borrowing money for at the prime rate two years ago. Fast forward two years, now you go into your local bank since the Fed has raised interest rates and guess what the prime rate is now when you go into your, to your bank? It's eight and a half percent. You go from being able to walk into your local bank and borrow money for a home equity line of credit tied to the prime rate, prime plus zero, for 3%. You go in there today for a home equity line of credit, it'll be prime plus whatever, but prime right now is eight and a half percent. So five and a half percent increase over the last two years from the Fed doing what? Trying to fight inflation. The Fed maintains that target by paying banks, money funds, and other financial firms to park cash at the central bank. And that is meant paying out substantially more in interest, which that's what they're doing. So when they raise interest rates, guys, they have to pay out more interest, right? In turn, what that has done over the last couple of years is they have went from operating at a profit to operating at a negative. See, when interest rates are super low, they can operate at a profit because they don't have to pay out interest. But when interest rates are higher, they got to pay out more interest. Therefore, they could operate at a negative, a.k.a. the $114 billion that they lost in 2023. That's basically what they're telling you. The Fed maintains that target by paying banks, money funds, and other financial firms to park cash at the central bank. Just like if you went to your local bank and you have some cash that you don't want to keep in your cookie jar in the back of your, 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 ca your kitchen cabinet, or, or, or you don't want to keep it in your safe, or you don't want to keep it under your, your, your mattress, you take it into your local bank and say, hey, bank, I got some money here. I want to put it in your bank, but I, I need y'all to pay me an interest rate. And they say, well, okay, Richard, we'll pay you, we'll, we'll pay you 4% on a money market. Central bank does the same thing. They pay banks and other money firms or financial firms, they pay them interest rates to keep their money or their cash with them, right? But when they do that, their operating expenses go up because they got to pay more interest. And in this case, it was a terrible 2023 for them because they lost $114 billion. The Fed's audited interest expense for banks reserve balances hit $176.8 billion. Now, when they say banks reserves, in our system, in our banking system, banks have to keep a certain amount of cash at all times, right? And a lot of them, they keep it right at the Federal Reserve. They keep that cash at the Federal Reserve, but the Federal Reserve has to pay them an interest rate on that cash. So, again, in 2023, it was a lot more. The Fed's audited interest expense for banks, reserve balances, 
hit 176.8 billion last year. That was in 2023, guys. Right? They had 176.8 billion for 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 ex interest expense associated with banks keeping their money at the Federal Reserve. Their reserves, right? Up 116.4 billion from 2022. And that and that's very explainable, right? In 2022, the Fed funds rate was zero, or at least at the beginning of 2022, right? It was zero. So they didn't have to pay the banks much interest to keep their reserves there. But in 2023, as they increased short-term interest rates to fight inflation, banks started making more interest income on their money that they kept at the Federal Reserve. So banks make interest income, and then the Fed has what? Interest expense. The banks get interest income, Feds have interest expense, right? And they're saying in 2022, it was, it, it was, it was, it was less. In 2023, it was 116 billion more. So yeah, they operated at a negative. While interest payouts from its re reverse repo facility was 104 billion last year from 41 billion to prior year. So, so as you raise these interest rates, as the Fed raises interest rates, they take on more expense, guys. They take on more interest expense as they increase interest rates. No different than when you walk in your bank and you put money in the money market account, they have to pay you more interest as interest rates go up. Now, your big boy too big to fail banks don't do that, but your medium size and your smaller banks definitely do that because that's the only way they're gonna attract deposits. And then they take those deposits like we've talked about in the past. They take those deposits and what do they do with them? They lend those deposits out to people who buy real estate, people who, who uh, go buy cars, who need financing. Uh, it, you may need a heck equity, a home equity line. So they lend it out to people who need home equity lines. They do personal loans. Uh, they do all kind of loans at the bank, but they use your money, your deposits to do that, right? So this whole circle, man, it comes full circle is what I'm saying, guys. It comes full circle. Meanwhile, the income the Fed earned from both bonds it owns was at $164 billion last year. Little change from 2022. So here we go. They paid out, they paid out $176.8 billion to banks in the form of interest, right? They also paid on reverse repo facilities, $104 billion, right? So if you're doing the math, you're talking about $280 billion that they paid out in interest. This is the Federal Reserve now. You guys got to understand how this thing works. So they paid out about $280 billion in interest expense, but they only collected from bonds and other securities about $163 billion, right? The Fed can create money to fund its operations when dealing with operating losses, which means it faces no obstacles to operate. Now, here's the thing. This is what you got to understand. They, come, they, they pay out $280 billion they collect $163 billion, and how do they cover the shortfall? Because you ain't have to be no math wizard to figure out $280 billion, you know what I'm saying? You got $163 billion in income, but you got $280 billion in expenses. You ain't got to be a rocket scientist to figure out that's negative. You're operating in the negative. So how do they cover the shortfall, guys? How do they cover the shortfall? Here we go. The Fed can create money to fund its operations when dealing with operating losses. <laughs> there you go. 
So they can just go out and just create money. <laughs> the Fed can create money to fund its operations when dealing with operating losses, which means it faces no obstacles to operate. It just creates more money. It, it, it captures its losses in an accounting device called a deferred asset. Now, we're not going to get into all the technical details, but, but, but I want you to understand this is how things operate at the federal level, especially with the Federal Reserve, right? This is how things operate. When the Fed returns to profitability, it will use excess earnings to reduce the deferred asset. So here we go. For you guys that I want to kind of walk you through the balance sheet, right? So basically what they're saying here is they go ahead. Let's just say $280 billion in, ex in expense, $163 billion in, in income. So we do the math on that. Let's just round it out to say a hundred billion dollar loss. Now, obviously, you know, it's a hundred and fourteen billion dollar loss, but I'm just going to round it to one hundred billion just to make it easy for math. They lost one hundred and fourteen billion. And I've told you why you got two eighty in expenses. You got one sixty three in 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 income. You don't got to be a rocket scientist to figure out you got one hundred and fourteen billion dollar shortfall. So what do they do for that 114 shortfall? They create an entry that says, okay, and they call it a deferred asset. So they create an entry called a deferred asset for 114 billion. Just, they, you know, they keep it somewhere on the balance sheet. I don't know, but they, 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 they just create a category that says, okay, 114 billion basically is an I owe myself, is an I owe myself, but they, Pull that to the side. And then what they do is, this is when the feds return to profitability, what do they do? They take the profits and pay down that deferred asset. So let's say in 2024, instead of operating at a negative, let's say they operate at a positive 100 billion. They'll take that positive 100 billion and they'll apply it to this deferred asset and wipe away 100 billion of the 114 billion that they're in the hole. But they just create money and keep operating until they're profitable again. Can you and I do that? Let me just ask you, do we get to do that? Or do we get in big financial trouble if we did that? See, the Federal Reserve gets to do that because they can just create money out of nowhere. They can just turn on the money printer, right? But you and I don't get to do that in our financial situation. See, I don't get to say, well, OK, I spent 280 bill, but I only made 163 bill. I have a 114 billion dollar shortfall in my budget or in my on, on my on my operating statement. See, I don't get to put that to the side and just keep printing money. I don't get to do that. I don't get to do that. What the Fed does, they get to just print money until they make money and then they pay the deferred asset back. We don't get to do that, though, guys. We can't run our, our financial house that way. A lot of us do run our financial house that way. The problem is we can't just keep printing money. What we do is, is we'll go to our credit cards or we'll try to go to our emergency savings if we have it. Some of us even went to our retirement savings to take money out of that in order to cover our shortfall. The Fed don't have to do that. They can just create more money and keep operating. We don't get to do that, though. So we can't manage our finances the same way the Fed can manage theirs because they get to print money. We don't. We got to be smart about how we manage our money. In 2023, the Fed did what? They're living on more than what they make. If you and I live on more than what we make, we are going to find ourselves in financial collapse. We can't live our life that way. We have to live on less than what we make because we don't have a money printer. The Federal Reserve has a money printer so they can just print money, print money, print money until they have a profitable year. And what does a profitable year mean? Interest rates are down, right? And they have less interest expense than what they make on their 
interest income securities. Right? Maybe they, I doubt they do that in 24 because interest rates are still high. But maybe in 25 they do it. Maybe in 26 they do it when interest rates come down. Here's what, here's what one of the Fed officials said. Fed officials have noted they've handed back substantial sums to the Treasury over the years. A St. Louis Fed report last year said it could take years before the Fed's able to once again return profits to the government. That's just telling you interest rates higher for longer, guys. That's basically all that little piece told you. They're coming out on record saying it may take years before the Fed will operate at a profit, right? It'll take, it could take years. What that means is interest rates are going to stay higher for long, and it could take years for interest rates to come back down to 2022 levels. Again, at the beginning of 2022, Fed funds rate was zero. Fed was flushed with cash. Why? because they did not have to pay as much interest expense to banks with further reserve funds or other financial firms who held money at the, at the Fed. Fast forward to 2024, Fed funds rate is 5.5%. When banks keep their reserves at the Federal Reserve, guess what? Got to pay them more cha-ching. Interest rates are higher. So just thought that was interesting, man, how the Fed runs its his business. I thought you guys would see, see things like this, guys, we need to know. Yeah, it's nice to just talk about the hot stock of the day. And but guys, this is the stuff you got to learn and understand. This is how the Fed runs its system here. This is how the system in our country works, because a lot of people, oh, well, how does the Fed get so much money? How can they just print money? Yeah, well, they just take it out of thin air. They just take it out of thin. They just print more. Or, or U.S. Treasury prints more. Somebody prints more up there in, in, at the federal level, right? But what happens is the Fed just use what they call a deferred asset, right? There's a deferred asset that they use. That's how they keep track of the money printing. They keep track of the money printing through this deferred asset component. And then once they get rates back down, they're profitable again, like they were in 22, They'll take that profit and start paying down that deferred asset bucket. It's going to take them a couple years to do that, though, right? It's going to take them a little bit to do that. But it's just interesting how the Fed works, right? How they create money, how, what, what their balance sheet looks like, right? It, it's just interesting, and I thought I'd share that with you. Let's move on to these credit card companies. Let, let, let's, let's take a look at these credit card companies. <laughs> They got caught with their hand in the cookie jar, guys, just to say the least. They got caught with their hands in the cookie jar. Here's the headline. Visa, MasterCard, reach $30 billion settlement over credit card fees. Isn't that something? That just came out this morning, guys, at 6.15 a.m. Eastern time. Visa and MasterCard reached an estimated $30 billion settlement to limit credit and debit card fees for merchants. With some savings likely to be passed on to consumers through lower fees. Isn't that nice? Why did they have to pay out the 30 bill though? Let's keep reading. The antitrust settlement announced on Tuesday is one of the largest in the U.S. history. And if it receives court approval, would resolve most claims in nationwide litigation that began in 2005. So they've been suing MasterCard and Visa since 2005. Look how long this takes, guys. Can you imagine the money these lawyers made? Ooh, woo. These lawyers are the one that get rich in suits like this. Not you and me. They may send you a check for like three cents. But these lawyers, whoo, they get rich, buddy. They get rich. Some critics believe it may not go far enough, saying the savings would be temporary and fees would remain high. I can agree with that. Y'all know how these credit card companies are, man. They're going to hit you over the head, man. If they can hit you over the head and get away with it, they're going to do it, right? 
Merchants have long accused Visa and MasterCard of charging inflated swipe fees. No, they ain't charging inflated swipe fees, not MasterCard and Visa. No way. Let's keep reading. Or interchange fees when shoppers used credit or debit cards and barring them through anti-steering rules from directing customers toward cheaper means of payment. So here's what they're talking about when they say that. You know how when you go to your, wherever you use your credit card at, let's say you go to the grocery store and you know when you put your card in that thing, it's gonna ask you debit or credit. Okay, see here's what the credit cards do not want the merchants to do. They don't want the merchants to tell you it's cheaper to do debit than it is credit. It's cheaper. They don't want, but they don't want the merchants telling you that, right? They want you to hit credit because they get more fees than if you hit debit. So that's what they're saying. That's what they mean by steering, anti-steering rules. They don't want the merchant telling you the cheaper way because why? The merchant benefits. You don't care because it's not coming out well. Ultimately, it does come out of your pocket, but on the front end, it really doesn't. Because if I go and swipe credit or if I swipe debit, I don't get no charge on my receipt saying, okay, Richard, we charged you 3% for that credit swipe, but you could have been charged 1.5% if you did the debit swipe. That fee is passed on to the merchant. But in turn, the merchant does what? If they're a good merchant, if they're a smart business merchant, what does the merchant do? They pass that fee on to you through what? Increase in prices of the goods and services that you're buying from them. These merchants ain't dumb now. They're going to pass on that fee to you. So ultimately, who gets hurt in all of this? The consumer. You and me, I told y'all guys, in this country, and pretty much most countries around, most developed first world countries, they exploit their citizens to make all the money. They exploit us. We think we ain't paying for that swipe, but ultimately you are because that merchant, if they're smart, they're going to increase the price of their goods and services to absorb that merchant fee that the credit card companies are charging them. Here's what I'm talking about. Sweet fees typically include small fixed fees plus a percentage of total sell amounts and average about 1.5% to 3.5% per transaction, according to bankrate.com. Again, that one and a half to three and a half percent is passed on to the merchant. And the merchants are always trying to fight that fee. But ultimately, if they can't fight it, they're going to pass it on to you and me. They're going to jack up prices. Yes, they are. Because they're not going to eat all of that and we not eat any of it. Ultimately, it's passed on to you, right? So let's keep moving here and see exactly what else happened. Here's, here's the settlement agreement. Under the settlement agreement, Visa and MasterCard would reduce swipe rates by at least four basis points, 0.04 percentage points for three years and ensure an average rate that is seven basis points below the current average for five years. This is what Visa and MasterCard are agreeing to. Both card networks also agree to cap rates for five years and remove anti-steering provisions. So now you come up to the counter, if this whole thing passes, it gets approved by the courts. Now merchants can tell you, hey, debit is cheaper. Debit is cheaper, yo. So now they can tell, kind of steer you to the one they want you to hit or, or, or use. Merchants will have more discretion to offer discounts or impose surcharges on cards with higher interchange fees. Many already warn customers at checkout they will pay more using credit cards instead of cash. 
Tried to tell you. It always comes back to us. It always comes back to you and me being railroaded for all this stuff, man. <laughs> I keep telling you. It always comes back to the American people who pay for all of this crap. All of it. It comes back to us. So let's keep moving here. The fee rollbacks in caps alone are worth $29.79 billion, according to court documents. And Visa estimated that small businesses comprise more than 90% of their settling merchants. I can't tell y'all that. Remember yesterday I told y'all 95% of the businesses in America are small businesses? Y'all think I'd just be pulling this stuff out of thin air. You're seeing what MasterCard and Visa just said. You're just seeing what they just said. Estimated that small businesses comprise more than 90% of their settling merchants. Not your big boy, blue chip. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Not Walmart. See, Walmart go in there and, and, and tell Visa and MasterCard, no, we're not paying y'all no 1.5%. No, we're not paying y'all no 3.5%. See, they got enough scale and they're big enough to do that because you do know Walmart and somebody in the chat correct me if I'm wrong but Walmart does what 450 billion in revenue a year I think it's the largest revenue producing company in the world now I could be wrong but somebody in the chat double check that for me but a company like Walmart carries a big stick and Visa and MasterCard don't want to mess with them so then they're going to charge them the same thing they're going to charge the local pizzeria on the corner of the street you live on. They're gonna beat that little local pizzeria over the head with all kinds of charges because that's where they make their money on the little mom and pops. The little mom and pops is where Visa and MasterCard, American Express, all of them make the majority of their money. The little mom and pops, not the big boys. The little mom and pops. Back to what I've always told you guys. Who gets hit over the head the most in this country when it comes to financials? You and me. You and me. 90% of Visa and MasterCard merchants are small businesses. Visa and MasterCard denied wrongdoing and agreeing to the settlement. Of course they did nothing wrong. No, we do nothing wrong. No. We want, we want three and a half percent every time somebody swipes something at your store. That, that ain't, we ain't doing nothing wrong. Not, not only do we want the three and a half percent, we want some more fees on top of that. Not only do we want that, we also want the consumer who's carrying balances on their credit cards to pay us 22 percent. Can you imagine how much money Visa and MasterCard make, guys? Not only are they getting the interchange fees. Not only are they getting the transaction fees, they're also getting interest expense from you. I mean, interest income from us. Because a lot of us carry, listen, you got $1.3 trillion in credit card debt in this country. $1.3 trillion. Average credit card interest rate right now is 22%. You do the math. Do the math. Just on the interest income they're getting. Do the math on $1.3 trillion in balances, in debt, $1.3 trillion. Do the math at 22% interest, compounding, I believe, daily, if not monthly, compounding daily or monthly, one of the two, I can't remember, but it's compounding at 22% on $1.3 trillion. You do the math. I don't think they're hurting, guys. I do not think these credit card companies are hurting. You do the math. You do the math. Crazy, ain't it? So let's go ahead and finish this thing up because I think it's important that we understand exactly what the total outcome here is. Visa and MasterCard denied wrongdoing and agreeing to the settlement. In separate statements, Visa's North American president Kim Lawrence said that the said the accord addressed true pain points identified by small businesses, while MasterCard general counsel 
said it gave businesses substantial certainty. They ain't gave businesses nothing. Guess what? Okay, we'll do this for three years. We'll do it for five years. And then guess what? We back to doing what we normally do. <laughs> Isn't that something crazy though? These people are already predatory, right? They predatory. These people are predatory. They win an agreement, but they only agree, one, they don't agree to no wrongdoing. Number two, they only agree to certain parts of it for three years, and they only agree to certain parts of it for five years. After the three years and five years, guess what? They go right back to doing what they've been doing. That's insane, man. That's insane. That is insane. Shares of Visa closed down 0.2%, while MasterCard rose 0.2%. So it didn't, it didn't affect them on the stock price at all, really. It didn't, it didn't affect them on the stock price at all. Ah, 30 bill, and guess what? It ain't even 30 bill that they're taking out of profits. It, well, future profits, I guess. So they're going to take the 30 bill out of future profits by lowering and reducing these fees for three years and, and, and five years. That, that, that's going to be like 30 bill, right? Opposition expected. Let's read this. The settlement came one year after the federal appeals court in Manhattan upheld a $5.6 billion class action settlement with Visa and MasterCard covering about 12 million merchants. Some merchants opted out of that settlement and are pursuing separate lawsuits seeking damages. Adam Levitin a Georgetown University professor of law and finance in an email said those merchants might object to Tuesday's settlement because it won't bind them. Crazy. Crazy, 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 guys. Crazy, crazy how these credit card companies are greedy. They're greedy. They're greedy. Merchant fees, interchange fees, interest income, you name it, annual fees that they charge for some of these cards, they are making money hand over fist. All while the American people have the highest credit card debt in the history of the United States, in the history of the world. We got the most credit card debt than any other nation in the world. At 1.3 trillion, guys, it's the highest level it has ever been in the history of credit cards. But yet and still, this is what they're doing to us. This is what happens when you get yourself out there and start using these credit cards improperly. This is what happens to small business owners. That's why now when you walk into some of these small business Places Like say if you go to one of these little restaurants and you go to get lunch or go get dinner. Now you see on the bottom of your credit card receipt, you'll see a transaction fee. What they're starting to do at some of these mom and pop shops, they're starting to charge you for that transaction fee. I go to a little spot for lunch here every now and then when I'm when I'm over in the city. And they are hitting people who use credit cards. They're hitting them with that credit card transaction fee. Basically, they're taking the fee that their credit card, like Master, MasterCard Visa, charges them, and they're putting it on your ticket. They're putting it, they're charging you for it right up front. They're telling you that right on the thing. It says, use a credit card. We're charging you 2.9% extra if you use a credit card. We're charging you 3.5% extra if you use a credit card. I keep telling y'all, it all comes back to you and me as the consumer. More businesses, more small business owners, as these fees continue to escalate, they're going to charge it to you. Either they're going to give it to you up front or they're going to build it into the price of the meal or whatever product or service you buy from. Ultimately, we get stuck with it. So please be careful with these credit cards, guys. $1.3 trillion in credit card debt, 22% interest rate. Do the math. Do the math. Average American family has about $6,500 worth of credit card debt. Average American family. About $6,500 worth of credit card debt at a 22% interest rate or higher. 
Yeah. And guess what? A lot of people can't pay them. Credit card payment delinquencies are up. Credit card defaults for balances are up. Be careful out there with them credit cards, guys. Y'all know how I, one of the four financial principles is what? Stay out of consumer debt. Credit card debt is consumer debt. It keeps you from getting to your financial freedom. You will not get to your financial freedom with a bunch of credit card debt, with a bunch of high interest rate loan debt, with a bunch of student loan debt. Can't get there. And if you do get there, it's going to take you 100 years because you got to pay off all this debt. See, at 22%, guys, you'll never pay the balance off. It'll take you 50 years to pay the balance off on $65,000, $7,000 worth of credit card debt at a 22% interest, especially if it's compounded daily or compounded monthly. It's going to take you 50 years to pay it off. Every dime you're making on the minimum payment is going to service interest. It's not knocking the principal down at all. It'll take you 100 years to pay it off. So be careful with this credit card debt. It's going to keep you in, in a financial chokehold and won't allow you to build wealth. You see what your credit card companies are doing for you. Oh, we got, oh, I like my Visa card because they give me miles. They give me this. Guys, these credit card companies ain't giving you nothing for free. Nothing. Any perks you get from them, you paying for them through something or some other American paying for it, they ain't giving you nothing free. You do know that, right? That's one thing about corporate America, big boy corporate America. They don't give you nothing free. Now, they may advertise it like they're giving you something free, but they don't give you nothing free. They care nothing about you. Only thing they care about is you making all your money and spending it to make them wealthier. The only thing that corporate America cares about, guys, is shareholders and highly paid executives. That's it. Shareholders, highly paid executives. You 99 percenters down here that are not haven't figured out the way you beat this system is to become a shareholder, not a I mean, yeah, you got to become a a shareholder, not a stakeholder. You got to be a shareholder. That's how you beat it. That's how you beat this whole system, this whole financial system. You got to become a shareholder, an owner. You have to become an owner. Got to figure that out, guys. Got to become an owner. That's why it's, in, it, it's important that you start now. Don't delay. Act today. Start now becoming a shareholder, not what they call a stakeholder. As a consumer, you're just a stakeholder because all you do is go in there and spend your money. Your vested interest is getting products and services for money that you give them. You're a stakeholder. Become a shareholder where you actually spend money at places, but you also are an owner of that place where you spend your money through shares or stock. Become a shareholder. I don't care if I got to go to Walmart like I went to Walmart earlier this week. If I'm going to go to Walmart and I'm not a big Walmart guy, but if I'm going there and I'm going to spend money there every single month, you know, three, four, five, six, seven, eight thousand dollars a month I spend for grocery if I got a family. If I'm gonna spend that kind of money, I gotta get a kickback. The only way I get a kickback is if I'm a shareholder. I'm an owner of Walmart. Very, very small owner, but I'm an owner. If I own their stock, I'm an owner, guys. Now I participate in their profits through their distributions or through their dividends. I keep telling y'all, stop just being a stakeholder and become a shareholder. That's how you change the game. That's how you build wealth. Yes, we all got to buy crap. But I'm not going to spend five, six, seven, eight thousand dollars $8,000 a month somewhere on groceries and I'm not getting some upside. No, if I'm going to go to a grocery store and spend that kind of money, I better be a shareholder. I need to be an owner of that grocery store. I need to be buying shares in increasing my value, getting my dividend, reinvesting my dividend, and building wealth along with me spending $1,000 a month there for groceries. I don't get it. I don't get why we spend money to own places that we won't even become an owner of. Why are you spending your money there? Right? 
So if you want to change the game, you got to become a shareholder, guys. You got to become an owner. Owners participate in the upside. Owners participate in the profits. Owners participate in the appreciation of the stock, in the appreciation of the company. As a stakeholder, I get no nothing. All I'm doing is just spending my money. I don't get nothing in return other than some groceries. I get nothing in return other than some groceries. I don't just want to be a stakeholder. I want to be a shareholder. Now, let's move on, guys, and let's talk a little bit about the labor market. And then we're going to end this thing talking about these bank failures. Let's start talking about a little bit about this labor market problem that some people think we're going to run into. Here is the headline. A chief economist who called the 2008 recession. So this economist actually was one of the people that predicted the 2008 recession, the great financial crisis. This was one of the economists that predicted it. Here's what he's got to say. A chief economist who called the 2008 recession shares five charts that show the labor market is set to weaken materially this spring, prompting the Fed to cut rates five times. Right? Why does he think it's going to weaken? Let's, let's, let's take a peek here. One of the big surprises of the Federal Reserve's Record hiking cycle over the last couple of years has been the strength of the labor market. Month after month, the U.S. economy has steadily added jobs and the unemployment rate has remained below 4%, which is correct. That's not a bad thing, right? Because what's two of the mandates? What are two of the mandates of the Federal Reserve? Two of the four things that they have to do. They have to do what? Price stability, which is trying to get inflation to 2%. They have a mandate for price stability. Another mandate they have is maximum employment. Those are two of the four things. The other two things is what? They oversee and regulate banks. And the fourth thing is our payment system. Those are the four things the Federal Reserve has to do. Right. Price stability in our economy, 2 percent inflation. They also got to, like I said, they have to have to maximize employment. So those are some of the things that it's important for us to know what the Federal Reserve does. That way we know how it affects our money. It affects our building wealth. Right. But all of that looks likely to change in the months ahead, according to Ian Shepherdson, the founder and chief economist at Pantheon Macroeconomics. Stevenson said in 2005 that the bubble in the U.S. housing market would send the economy into a recession. A scenario that came to fruition over the following few years after the housing market began to unravel in 2006. More recently, Stevenson said a recession would unfold in 2023, which did not happen. He missed on that one. In a note to clients on Monday, Stevenson said various parts of the U.S. economy are set to weaken over the coming months, including the labor market. For the first time in this cycle, an array of indicators point tentatively to a meaningful slowdown in economic growth driven by the consumer and a clear weakening in the labor market as soon as the second quarter of 2024. This is what this guy is saying. None of these numbers are yet definitive. And we need to see another couple months of soft retail sales. Depressed hiring indicators and evidence of rising layoffs before we can be sure that growth will slow to the point where last year's upside surprises seem like ancient history, he continued. But the risk is greater now than at any point since the post-COVID rebound. And we would be surprised if a real shift 
has not emerged in the data by the summer. So this guy is predicting the only thing saving us right now, guys, from catastrophic disaster financially in this country is the labor market. Remember, we ain't got no personal savings no more because we blew through those. Remember, interest rates are super duper high, so we don't have access to borrow money. See, that supply of money has been turned off. The supply of money from personal savings has been turned off. The only thing we got left is our wages from our job. That's all we got left. If this guy is right, he's saying that's going to start shrinking, weakening, according to this guy. Right now, markets are pricing in three 25 basis point rate cuts from the Fed in 2024. But Stevenson said that number is more likely to be five if his read on the data is correct. In 2025, the central bank will have to cut an additional four times. So now this cat is saying, no, pump the brakes. The Fed ain't going to reduce three times. They're going to have to reduce five times. Because the job market is going to deteriorate so fast. The only way to stimulate the economy will be to reduce interest rates as rapidly as the labor market decreases. See, anytime interest rates are reduced, it stimulates the economy. Now, some of y'all might ask, well, Richard, why would it stimulate the economy? Think about it this way. Anytime you introduce a new source of money to our economy and people can get that money, what do they do with it? They spend it. That's why the economy will rebound. That's why the economy will bounce, right? So anytime a new supply of money is introduced to our economy, people get that money and they spend it on things, which in turn does what? Increases the productivity of our economy, of our businesses, right? So all I'm telling you is, if the Fed does reduce rates this year, and if they reduce them by three or five times, they're introducing a new money supply to our economy through what? The ability to borrow money again at cheaper interest rates. Now, I may not be able to borrow money on my line of credit at 8.5% prime rate plus 3 which is about 11 and a half percent. I may not be able to borrow money at that being that expensive, but if they cut rates and let's say the fit, let's just say prime rate goes from eight and a half percent to six and a half percent. Now it becomes a little bit more attractive for me to borrow money on my line of credit. And then I take that money and I do whatever I do with it to stimulate our economy. So that's basically what this cat is saying. If, the labor market continues to deteriorate, then the Fed is going to be forced to do more than three cuts. They're going to have to do five cuts just so that the economy doesn't go into a recession, just so that they can stimulate the economy. Nothing changes the minds of policymakers and investors faster than a sustained softening in payrolls. And he's absolutely right, guys. I keep telling you all over and over and over this, this whole thing only works in this country when you and I got money to spend. If we ain't got no money to spend, this whole thing fails. Our whole economy collapses. It's all predicated on you and me having a handful of money that we're willing to depart with and buy crap we don't need in most cases. That's the only way this whole thing works in our financial system. It's all predicated on the majority of us taking every dime we make and introducing it back into the economy in the form of buying crap we don't need. This whole system only works when we do that. That's basically what this cat's saying. In order to get us to do that, what does the Fed have to do? Got to reduce interest rates to make it more attractive to borrow money. Because especially if our payroll gets shrinkened, Remember what happened in the pandemic, right? 
What happened in the pandemic? Payrolls went down. Companies shut down. People were forced to stay home. What did the government have to do in order for us not to have a 100% collapse of our financial system? The government had to do what? Turn on the money printer. They had to turn on the money printer and start giving out stimulus. PPP loans. Right? Interest rates were what? Zero? I could go out and borrow money. I could go get a car loan during the pandemic for 2%. 1.75 from the bank, not from the manufacturer for all their little kickback deals. I could go to my local credit union and borrow money at 1.75% for six years. Yep. Why? Because they needed to stimulate the economy. Now I go back to that same credit union today. Guess what that interest rate is for that same loan? It's seven and a half percent. It goes from 1.75% in 2020 to 2024, 7.5%. See, that's when the money supply is turned off when interest rates go up. Now, if they want to turn the money supply back on, take that 7.5% interest rate that I got to pay to my local credit union to get my car loan all they got to do in order to stimulate the economy again is they reduce those interest rates. Now, my credit union rate goes from 775 down to 475. Oh my goodness. Now it opens up the floodgates. Now people are back to borrowing money again and spending again. So 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 I get where this guy's coming from. The only thing saving us right now is payroll wages and basically what he's saying is nothing changes the minds of policymakers and investors faster than sustained softening in payrolls so if the leading indicators are right the tone of the fed will be very difficult by the summer and markets will be pushing for more aggressive rate cuts stevenson included a number of charts which we're not going to go into but I just wanted to give you guys that little tidbit on the job market and how important it is to the overall health of our economy right now, because that's all we got. Most of us, that's it. We ain't got no savings. We got no access to loans because rates are too high. Just gave you that quick little scenario about my local credit union. 2020, I could go in there and get a 1.75% interest rate on a car loan for six years. Today, 7.5%. This is a credit union. Can you imagine going into your normal bank? Now, don't get me wrong. I know some manufacturers got zero interest and all that, but that's from manufacturers. That ain't from no bank. That's just a, a, an incentive that the manufacturer is willing to do because they just want to sell cars. See, the manufacturer makes their money from the sold car. They don't care if they got to carry part of the debt and don't get no interest on it. They want the car sold. That's where they make their money. They're not banks. So they will do these little zero interest Ford Motor Company and some of these other ones will do zero interest on brand new cars because manufacturers want the cars off of their manufacturing lots. It's not the dealership that's giving it to you. It's the manufacturer. The manufacturer makes their money from the actual sold car. And the way they incentivize people to make to, to, to buy these cars in troubling times where interest rates are super high, they will come in and offer a zero or a 199. But they they're doing that so they can sell cars. They ain't doing that because they're trying to trying to give you a great rate. They don't care about the rate. They care about moving them units because that's where their money is tied up in is the actual hardware. Right. So know that how the labor market plays into what's happening in our entire economy, guys. You got to understand that if you're going to be an investor and be able to get yourself to your pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, you got to know these things, right? That's why every day I spend time on these lives giving you my opinion. I'm no expert. I'm just a guy that got 25 years experience in all this stuff, man. Been building wealth for over 25 years and done a pretty dang on good job of it by myself. 
right? So all I'm trying to give you is just, just give you some information and give you my spin on it. Ultimately, you take the information you need, you throw back the information you don't need. At, at, at some point, you got to go out and build your wealth. And, and right now is the appropriate time. One last thing we're going to cover, we're going to get out of here. And that one last topic we're going to cover, guys, is these banks. There, there's, a, uh, there's a growing concern about banks, bank failures. Growing concern about some bank failures. So let's, let's dive into that. But before we do, lock it in with a thumbs up, guys. If you're in here just popping in, lock it in with a thumbs up. That really helps the channel. It really helps me understand that the content that I'm providing you guys with is the right content. So if you can hit, hit that thumbs up button just to let me know you're rocking with me, let me know you're locked in, lock it in with a thumbs up if you don't mind. Also, keep in mind, um, there's a Moomoo link down in the description box. I use Moomoo as my primary brokerage account. They got a special offer for you guys, up to 15 free stocks. If you try out their brokerage account, you put $100 in, they're going to give you five free stocks. You put 1000 in, they're going to give you 15 free stocks. That link is down in the description box as well. So let's keep moving on here, guys. This is the last topic we're going to discuss, and then we're going to wrap it up for today. We're going to talk about some of these potential, potential bank failures. Let, 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 let's, let's dive into it. Here's the headline. S&P Global downgrades outlooks on five regional U.S. banks to negative. See, banks are rated, right, guys? They're rated. These cats at S&P Global have downgraded five super regionals. They ain't big boy too big to fail, but they're super regionals, which pretty big banks. They're downgrading them. Let's see why. And then I'm going to tell you why that's important for you and me. Ratings agency S&P Global on Tuesday, which was March 26, downgraded five regional U.S. banks due to their commercial real estate exposure. Remember, over the last several weeks, guys, we've been talking about this commercial real estate problem that we're about to have here in the United States. We got one trillion dollars in commercial real estate coming due. 24 and 25. And most of that exposure, that real estate, that commercial real estate exposure is on the shoulders of regional, medium sized, small banks, not your big boy, too big to fail banks. Right. So here we go. Here we go. This is stuff you need to know because your money is probably in some of these regional banks. So I would listen up to find out what's going on here. S&P Global on Tuesday downgraded five regional U.S. banks due to their commercial real estate exposure in a move likely to reignite investor concerns about the health of the sector. That would be the CRE sector. The rating agency downgraded First Commonwealth Financial, m and Bank, Synovus, I know Synovus, they got some of them right here where I live. Synovus, Financial, Trustmark, and Valley National Bank Corp to negative from stable. So they go from stable to negative. That is not good, guys. That's not good at all. I'm sorry. If you had one of them four banks, uh, you might want to do a little checkup from the neck up. You might want to go in there and talk to somebody because if you one of these four banks, First Commonwealth Financial, m and Bank, Synovus Financial, Trustmark, and Valley National Bank Corp., you've just been downgraded from stable to negative. That's not good. The negative outlook revisions reflect the possibility that stress in the CRE, commercial real estate market, may hurt the asset quality and performance of the five banks. All that fancy jargon, that fancy jargon I just read you, all that means is the assets. What are assets, guys, on a bank's balance sheet? What is an asset on a bank's balance sheet? Loans. That's the asset. 
Loans are an asset because it puts money in the bank's pocket. It puts money in the bank's pocket through interest income. So it's an asset. Remember, anything that puts money in your pocket on a monthly basis is an asset. Anything that takes money out of your pocket on a monthly basis is a liability. That's how banks look at it, right? And that's how we should look at it. So they're just telling you here, the negative outlook revisions reflect the possibility that stress in the CRE market may hurt the asset quality and performance of the five banks, which have some of the highest exposures to CRE loans among banks we rate. What did I tell you guys? These little regional, medium-sized, small banks, they make the majority of their money from loans. Not like the big boy too big to fail banks. The big boy too big to fail banks make their money from 85 to 100 different lines of business. Regional banks, medium-sized banks, and small banks do not have that type of diversity in their revenue sources. <laughs> they do not. Their main revenue source is loans. So if loans go bad, especially commercial real estate loans, what does that do to a bank? It tightens their income capability. Their income, I would say 85% of their income, but probably 80% of their income is coming from loan revenue, interest from loans that they have outstanding. That's their asset. They're telling you the, they're heavily exposed to the commercial real estate loans. And the commercial real estate market is finna go through some really major hiccups if interest rates don't come down here soon. That's what they're telling you. So they downgraded them. Representatives from the banks did not immediately respond to the request for comment outside business hours. Investor concerns over regional banks, CRE exposure intensified this year after the New York Community Bank Corp flagged a surprise quarterly loss citing provisions, provisions soured CRE loans, which triggered a sell-off in the U.S. regional banking shares. The bank has sold assets to sure up its balance sheet. That's what's happening. That CRE exposure, guys, is heavy, heavy, heavy exposure to these regional, medium-sized, and small banks. Why? Because the majority of those banks have on their balance sheet this $1 trillion in commercial real estate loans that are coming due in 20 and 24, and the outlook is not very good because interest rates are super high, and a lot of these loans that they have on their balance sheet have low interest rates. But when that interest rate expires in 24 and 25, guess what? When it adjusts, it's going to be higher. Could be 2.2% higher, could be 3% higher. What's going to happen is that 2 to 3% increase in interest rate cuts into the rental cash flow. Plus, a lot of these CRE properties have lost tenants. So their revenue has changed too since they originally did the loan. So not only do you have you lost tenants, you also get a 3% jump in your interest rate. That puts a really, really, really tight squeeze on cash flow of that property. And that's what's concerning a lot of investors in these regional banks. That's why these regional banks are starting to, their stock prices are starting to wobble a little bit as investors flee. Because they're thinking, I don't want to be the one holding the bag with this bank if, you know, 50% of their loan portfolio goes sideways. I don't want to be the one with a worthless stock. So a lot of investors are taking their money out of these banks, out of their stock, and moving it elsewhere. It's a concern. Only reason I read that and tell that to you guys is because I know a lot of us probably are depositors at these banks. I just read you four of them that they downgraded. And like I said, you better have a, a checkup from the neck up with these banks. If you are a customer or a depositor in these four banks, you may want to just go take a, you, you may want to take yourself up there and roll down the windows, kick the tires to make sure, you know, they're sound. Because if they're not, 
They're not going to tell you they're not sound. What's going to happen is you're going to go there one day and the door going to be locked with a big old sign on it from the SEC. I'm not the SEC, but the FDIC. Big old sign from the FDIC. They're not going to tell you. They're not going to send you a letter. They're going to give you a phone call. Okay, hey, Richard, uh, you've been a, a fantastic customer. Just want to let you know we're having some problems and uh, probably not going to be over next week. No, they're not going to call you and do that. They're not going to send you an email. You're just going to go up there one day and everything going to be closed and your money going to be tied up until FDIC can kick in. So just be careful, guys, out here uh, with these small banks, these medium-sized banks, these regional banks. You don't want to get caught with your pants down. So, so be due diligent and, and make sure you don't have all your eggs in one basket. Investors and analysts have been worried that higher borrowing costs, see, I just told you all about borrowing costs, right? Borrowing costs, they're going to go up, right? Investors and analysts have been worried that higher borrowing costs and lingering low occupancy rates. See, y'all think I just be making this stuff up. I know what I'm talking about. That's what's happening. Higher interest rates for these loans that are maturing and lower occupancy. All that means is they don't have the same amount of tenants that they used to have. That's a double whammy. That's a double whammy. Your revenue for the property decreases because you have less tenants. Your expenses for the property increases because you got more interest payment. You got bigger interest rate. It's a double whammy, man. Be careful out there. Double whammy. Investors and analysts have been worried that higher borrowing costs, lingering lower occupancy rates for office spaces in the aftermath of the pandemic could result in more lenders lose more lenders taking losses as borrowers default on loans. Heavy, heavy hitters in the office space and the retail space. Multifamily is doing okay. But office and retail, not so good. Industrial, multifamily, okay. So just, just know what your bank has on their balance sheet and see where their concentration is. If their concentration is commercial real estate loans, that's something to pay attention to, guys. That's all I'm saying. Tuesday's downgrades come a year after the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, which heightened investor sensitivity about the health of the U.S. regional banks. There you go, man. There you go. I done gave it to you the best I can give it to you. We're going to wrap this thing up and, and let you eyes out of here. I got more things I got to do today, but I just wanted to run you guys through this information about the Federal Reserve. I thought that was important that we understand how the Federal Reserve works, how it makes its money, what are the, the income sources coming in, what are the revenue sources going out, and, and how do they cover the shortfall? We already know how they cover the shortfall. They just make more money. And then they put a little thing over here on the side called the deferred asset. And as they get profitable again, they just pay down that, that, that deferred asset. But they just print money. They just keep printing money, right? Uh, they're partners with the United States Treasury, right? They also bail out the big boy U.S. government through buying treasury bonds from the U.S. government, right? U.S. government collects four, million, four trillion in taxes, but they got seven trillion in expenses. They got to get the three trillion from somewhere. That's where they get it from, or at least part of it they get from the, the Federal Reserve because the Federal Reserve then comes and buys bonds from them. U.S. Uh, Treasury Department creates all this stuff. Fed steps in. Federal Reserve steps in, buys some of them. But we, we've got other countries that buy them too. Japan, China, they they own all. The, you, you got several com countries out there that have about $7.6 trillion of our debt, our $34 trillion worth of debt. You got, you got countries like China, Japan, the UK, Australia. They own a bunch of that debt. We owe them. Our government, owe, the United States owes them money to the tune of six, $7.6 trillion. So you got to understand how this whole Federal Reserve thing works. Uh, we talked a little bit about these, these crooked credit card companies. <laughs> 
Don't sue me now. I mean, don't sue me, MasterCard and Visa. I like y'all. I got some. I got some MasterCard and Visa cards, so don't sue me. Um, we talked a little bit about that, how that will affect small business owners, and then in turn, the small business owner will pass that cost on to you. That's how it works in this country, right? And then we talked a little bit about the labor market, how, hey man. The labor market, if it softens, it may force the Fed to lower interest rates more than three times this year, at least according to one analyst, right? So we'll see how that plays out and how that affects us. And then we talked about these bank failures or potential bank failures. Uh, we talked about a couple of uh, four banks that have been downgraded by one rating agency. That don't mean all of them downgraded them, but I don't want my bank to be downgraded on nobody's list. That gives me concern, especially when you got commercial real estate exposure like a lot of these banks do, these little medium size and regional and, and small banks. I guarantee you, you go to your little, your little hometown bank and, you, and if they'll share with you their, their balance sheet, I guarantee you that balance sheet has a lot of loans on it because that's where they make their revenue from. They don't have 85 to 100 lines of business like your big boy, too big to fail banks. They make their money from many different ways, right? Small banks, regional size, medium sized banks don't have that ability. Most of their revenue comes from loans, guys. You got to know what type, what makes up the loan composition, how much of it is real estate debt, how much it is consumer debt, how much of it is credit card. You know what I'm saying? You got to know what that makeup is and how that affects the revenue stream of your bank. If 25, 50 percent of that loan portfolio goes sideways, what does that mean for your bank? Probably not good. Probably not good. So be careful there. Like I said, guys, if you want up to 15 free stocks, Moomoo is going to give you up to 15 free stocks when you open your, your new Moomoo brokerage account. If you put $100 in that Moomoo brokerage account, they're going to give you five free stocks. If you put $1,000 in that Moomoo brokerage account, they're going to give you 15 free stocks. Limited time offer. Don't delay. Act today, get down in that description box, click on that Moomoo link, open up your new Moomoo account today, go get that free stock, go get that free money, then send me an email and let me know you've opened your Moomoo account, you funded it, I'm going to send you that wealth transfer blueprint video where I outline the three big boy blue chip assets that I'm going to be buying in 2024 and beyond. I've been buying SPLG. FTEC, pretty much every day the market is open. I'm taking 100 to $300 per day, and I'm buying those two. I'm going to probably, yeah, about 200 days this year, trading days. All 200 of those trading days, I'm going to be buying SPLG, FTEC. And then every month, I'm going to be dollar cost averaging into VTSAX, which is a total stock market index fund. And then I'm also be buying the Magnificent Seven. That's it, that's it for me, that's it. It's not fancy, it's just fundamentals. Big boy S&P 500 ETF, big boy information technology ETF, big boy individual stocks through the Magnificent Seven, all big boys, all trillion dollar value companies for the most part, the all, all magnificent seven, are all trillion dollar or up value companies. So all big boys, all blue chip, none of this little stuff, all big boy stuff. That's all I'm gonna be doing 365 days a year in the market. Why? Because I never know when I'm going to the moon. Gotta be strapped in on the rocket ship, ready to go to the moon 365 days a year. Never know when I'm going to the moon. So I'm in the market every single day, every single month, every single year for the next 10 years to double my net worth, to get to my pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Y'all already know what my end result is. We got to have an end result, guys. See, see, our plan makes no sense if we don't have a destination. I don't just jump in my car one morning and just start driving. I, most people don't do that. Most people sit down and say, you know something, I want to take a road trip. Well, where do you want to go, Richard? You know something, I want to, I want to, I want to take a trip to the Grand Canyon. You know, I want to go see the Grand Canyon. All right, well, 
Grand Canyon a long ways from Southwest Florida. I mean, you can't do that in five minutes. You got to plan this thing. You know, where are you going to stop? Where are you going to, what hotels are you going to stay at? Where are you going to pick up food at? What, plan this thing out. But see, I, 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 I can't just jump in the car and just go to the Grand Canyon. I got to plan it out. But I got to know where I'm going before I can plan it out. So same thing with our financial life, guys. If we don't have a destination, it's hard to put a plan together. It's hard to put a plan together when you don't know where you're going. You got to figure out where you're going. See, me, I know where I'm going. In 10 years, I know exactly where I want to be. I want my net worth doubled, and I know exactly what that net worth will generate in income, and I'm going to take that income. I'm going to go buy me a little piece of land in the, in the Caribbean Ocean on one of them little islands out there, I'm going to buy me a little piece of land, build me a little house on it, and that's where I'm going to spend the golden years. See, I already know what I want to get accomplished. Now all I got to do is just put the plan together. What's my plan? It's the wealth transfer blueprint. Pretty simple. Every dime I make, I'm going to take that money and put it in these three big boy blue chip assets that I just mentioned. That's what I'm going to do for the next 10 years. I ain't going to worry about if the market's up or down. Don't even matter to me. All I care about is, will the market be worth more in 10 years than it is today? That's all I care about. I don't care about what's happening. Oh, yesterday it was green. Yesterday it was red. Oh, should I pull my money out? Should I do? When I hear people talking like that, I already know they don't even have a plan. So when you send me an email and you go to talking about, should I pull it out now? Should I this and should I that? You don't even have a plan. Don't even have a plan. Because if you had a plan, you'll know this is part of the process. This is how the stock market works. There are going to be up days. There are going to be down days. But ultimately, history tells me if I leave it in there long enough and I dollar cost average in long enough, history tells me over a 10 year block of time, I should get somewhere between a 7 to a 10 percent rate of return on my money. That's what history says. That's not what I say. That's what history says. And if you know that, you know the only thing you should be concerned with is, is how much money can I invest on a monthly basis? Can I make more money to invest more and just do that for 10 years? If you do that and you're in the right investments, guys, with a historical track record of multiplying money, you give yourself a chance to have a big old pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. I'm going to have a big old pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. I am. I don't worry about nothing other than how much money can I make, how much of it can I keep, and how much can I invest every single day, every single month. The market is open every single year to get to my pot of gold at in the rainbow. I don't care if it's red, green, purple, orange, turquoise. I don't care what color it is because I know if I can do that for 10 years, history tells me I win. And I win big. So if you want to be a part of that game plan, guys, you know what to do. Click on that link down in the description box and get yourself in the game. Stop sitting on the sideline. I keep telling y'all when this rocket ship take off, I want to be on it. I don't want to be down here on Earth looking at people that I know in the rocket ship going to the moon. And I'm still down here because I'm what? Scared. I, 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 I don't know enough. Uh, uh, I got... Uh, you know, people, uh, everybody's saying different things. Uh, the guy on CNN says it ain't the right time. Uh, uh, all kind of excuses. You know how we are, right? We, we, we make all kind of excuses when we, when we are afraid. We make all kind of excuses when we are procrastinating. We make all kind of excuses when we have bad behavior with money. We just do. That's, that's how we're wired. Anytime we're afraid, we're going to make all kind of excuses. But guess what? Three big killers of financial freedom. Fear, pride, greed. Don't fall into that trap, guys. Get yourself started. Get yourself started. A little as 100 bucks. You get five free stocks. If you want to really, if you want to really take this thing and, and, and really run with it, take $1,000 a month. Put it in something. Paper assets. One of the big boy blue chip paper assets. Put it in there. If you get an 8% return, 8% return, 
every single year, on average, on a thousand bucks, on a thousand bucks a month, you do that for 10 years, you got a quarter of a million dollars in your nest egg. I don't know anybody, well, normal folks, the 99 percenters. I don't know any 99 percenters that a quarter of a million dollars doesn't change their life. Somebody in the chat that tells me a quarter of a million dollars won't change your life in 10 years, your financial life. Can anybody in the chat tell me that a quarter of a million dollars would not significantly change their life in the next 10 years? And all I got to do to get that quarter of a million is discipline myself, be consistent and be patient and take a thousand dollars a month and put it in something that has an eight percent rate of return. Well, where do you get that from? Go look at history. I think the S&P has done that. If you don't believe me, go to the trillion dollar research lab. Go into the trillion dollar research lab and put in S&P 500 annual rate of return over the last 10 years. And then I want you to put in a rate of return over the last 90 years and see what it says. Guys, this ain't rocket scientists. We, we, we make it rocket scientists, but it ain't. It's pretty easy. It's like, a, it's like a, a kindergartner can do this if, as long as they discipline themselves. See, the problem with us is we don't want to discipline ourselves. Problem with us is we don't want to be consistent. The problem with us is we do not have any patience. We want everything right now. Why? Because that's how you've been taught since you were born. You ain't got to wait for nothing. Get it today. Don't worry about tomorrow. That's not promised to you. Do it today. Go ahead and have that burger. You ain't got to do no working out. Just eat that burger. Eat the hoop. Something going to get you. Something going to take you from this place. Go eat that burger. You ain't got to do no working out. Enjoy yourself. You earn that burger. Before you know it, it catch up to you, right? Them burgers catch up to you. Before you know it, you got high blood pressure. Before you know it, you got something going on with your arteries around your heart. They catch up to you, to it catch up to you guys. All I'm telling you is develop some discipline, develop some consistency, and develop some patience in your life. This is good stuff. These are good behaviors to have, not only financially, but in every other aspect of your life. Well, guys, I appreciate you rocking with me. Lock it in with a thumbs up before you get out of here. I will be back tomorrow, 1030 a.m. Eastern time. Appreciate you rocking with me. Hopefully this information I covered today was helpful. And if it was, lock it in with a thumbs up before you get out of here. That's okay. Just lock it in with a thumbs up to let me know the information I covered today was helpful. Lock it in with a thumbs up before you get out of here. That will let me know I'm on the right path. The information that I'm supplying you guys with on a daily basis is on the right path. So please lock it in with a thumbs up before you get out of here. Thoughts become things. If you can see it in your mind, you can hold it in your hands. You guys keep chasing your greatness. Never stop believing in yourself. Stay healthy, get wealthy, and I'm going to catch you guys on the next one. Peace.